have your Bible tonight. I just realized this week that I'm not going to probably get to tell the Christmas story like I normally do every year. And so I said, you know what? We're going to do it on Wednesday night. So we're going to do it tonight. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2. As you're turning there, let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for your faithfulness, for your revelation knowledge that comes to us through your word, for the application that we can see as it applies to our life. And so, Father, I pray tonight that as we read your word, Lord, that it becomes life to us, that it be an aha moment in our life to say, I get it. And we're going to give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's talk about the whole Christmas story and really what it is. The whole Christmas story is about faith. It's really that simple. It's all about faith. And this is the one thing that I think that all of us need to understand about faith. The first thing I want to say about faith tonight is I already, I already made a statement about uh, faith being simple obedience moved with conviction. The second point I believe the Spirit's talking to us as it pertains to faith tonight is this. Very seldom is faith understandable. Let me say that again because it's an important point for us to understand tonight because we're going to learn about this. Very seldom is faith understandable. And when we look at the Christmas story, it's never more portrayed than it is in this particular story about what faith is. It, it all starts with uh, a, a peer, appearing to some, an elderly couple that had been praying to have a baby that hadn't been able to have a baby. And the next thing you know, they're pregnant. Elizabeth's pregnant. Uh, it's one of those aha moments when the angel of the Lord appears uh, to John and he's serving, and uh, not to John, uh, to Zechariah as he's serving uh, and he says, the prayers that you prayed, God has answered. Now, this is, this is a really tricky one because you realize God's heard every prayer that you prayed, but his timing's not our timing. So here we are maybe 30 years later, and he says the prayer, and Zechariah's so old, he don't even remember what prayer. <laughs> now, we know he's under 50, okay? Uh, he, he's, pro he's probably in his late 40s because he's still serving in the temple and priest served in the temple until they were 50 years of age. Uh, and then they went into a semi-retirement type of deal uh, as proclaimed by the Word of God. Uh, I'm thankful that we don't do that today. Amen. Amen. Or I'd be in Hawaii laying on the beach right now and getting my suntan for Christmas. I wouldn't like that. Oh, yes, I would. That, that's not true. That's not true. We begin the story with this, why God then? Why, why not answer that earlier? Because God's timing is not our timing. Uh, and then he appears to a virgin, a teenager. Well, one extreme to the other. And, and he appears to this teenage girl who's been betrothed to this man uh, and, and says, this is what's going to happen. And we say, why her? Why then? Why now? We come to chapter 2, and I, I, what I'm talking about tonight, when we begin talking about faith, is this. Is that the plan of God is not always understandable to us. Now, let me explain why that's so important. In, in the world we live in, and to people who come to church, or people, really, most importantly, maybe watching tonight that don't come to church. Because they want, they want the will of God and the plan of God to be understandable and controllable. And it is neither. Right. Did, did everybody hear what I just said? The will of God is neither understandable or controllable sometimes. Right. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense because I, I'd like to have it all planned out and know what I'm going to do right in, here and then. And you look at this story and this is the birth of the Son of God. And there's nothing in this story that even conveys that. In fact, everything in this story is going to go contrary to what we would, we would want to naturally believe would be the will of God. And what happens is a lot of people quit coming to church or quit on their faith because those kind of things happen in their life and they say that couldn't, been, couldn't have been the plan of God. 
But the Word of God says all things work together for good. Wait, wait a minute. Did you hear what I just said? All things work together for good. So we're in chapter 2. It says, at, the, at that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. And she gave birth to her first son, a son, and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, in a trough, because there was no lodging available for them. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And when the angels had returned... To heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby, lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. That's interesting in this particular story. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for they had heard all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Here's how the plan of God gets carried out. First and foremost, there's great hope for us because the plan of God, number one, gets carried out by God using imperfect people that are willing. Anybody here imperfect tonight? Raise your hand. Anybody here willing tonight? Both Mary and Joseph, both they weren't perfect people, nor were these shepherds. But in this story, it's not anything about perfect people, just people who are willing to be obedient. Now, as we look at this story, there's a lot going on here. And so we have to gather in all of what's happening here in chapter 2. Because the plan of God begins with God using imperfect people, and we get that part. Let's get to number two, which is found in in verse number one there. That the plan of God was for God to use at just the right time an antagonistic government to accomplish moving those who otherwise probably wouldn't move. It's a great Facebook post. For all of you who love to make those kind of Facebook posts. I, I saw one I liked the other day. They said, I liked it better when people talked about when they went to bed and when they went to the bathroom. (laughs) Because now we have to hear everything else that's opinion. And here's the thing that I want us to understand. The Roman Empire was a very antagonistic government towards Judaism and belief. They wanted to impart their culture. In fact, that was a part of their whole vision, is that we're going to take over the world with our empire, and we're going to establish our culture everywhere we go. And in the midst of this, let's get the picture. How many ladies here have been pregnant and had a baby? Raise your hand. She's in her third trimester. Can I tell you something? She's not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. Uh, Even being a young lady, she's not going anywhere. But all of a sudden, there comes this decree 
There is going to be a census that's taken, and it doesn't matter who you are or what state you're in. If you're not dead, you need to go to the place that you report to. And they have to travel from Galilee all the way to Bethlehem. Two to three days walking or traveling, some believe. Probably nine months pregnant. Can you imagine that? Every little bump, I remember when Shelly was pregnant, we were driving the car, and every little bump, she would say, do you have to hit every little bump in the road? <laughs> and what we understand is this, let's get the plan of God. This God sometimes uses anti-antagonistic forces to move us out of the place that we are. Do we like it? And we would say, oh, that's not God. That's just the devil. <laughs> Come on now. That's right. That old Herod, he's the devil. And they were making all kinds of posts on Facebook that he was the son of the devil. Herod was a Democrat. And God used this perfect storm to move this couple that otherwise probably would not move and get them to the place where they needed to be. And I'm telling you something. When you're willing to come and understand this with faith, to say, God, I'm committed to you, and faith is this, I don't always understand. That's true faith. True faith is moving when you don't always understand. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense that this angel appeared to me, he appeared to you. We're to have the Son of God, and now I'm nine months pregnant, and there hasn't been supernatural provision. I thought if God, the preacher said, well, if God says if we go, it, he'll make provision. Okay, stay with me. And so now they go to the place where they're supposed to be, and they can't even find a room. How does that fit in your theology? The Son of God, no less. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you because this is so good, and this is what I got this morning when I was meditating and praying over this particular scripture. God is so good. The Word of God tells us in Philippians to take the same attitude that Christ came, that he came making himself of nothing. And, and we really don't get that. Because when you understand he was born human in a stable, you can't get any lower than that. You understand, he came and he took the entry-level position. Everybody get what I'm saying? For all of you who want to go wake up, all you young people who want to wake up and be the CEO, CEO one day, Jesus didn't even do that. He came born in the entry-level position, in the mailroom, in the basement. You can't get any lower where he was. And we want to say, oh, that ain't God. That ain't God. And you understand something. This is what we begin to understand. We're talking about the Son of God. So how can it not be God? You say, well, that's different. It was, he was the Son of God. And he had to fulfill prophecy. But God wouldn't do that to me. The Word of God says this, that the Son of God, the Apostle Paul said this, he said, the Son of God is being birthed in you. Tell me what that process looks like. That the Son of God is being birthed in us. So number one, he used imperfect but willing vessels. Number two, he used an antagonistic government. And number three is this. 
true humility. Now, we get this picture, and when we begin to understand the Judean countryside there around Bethlehem, a lot of people believed that it was this little lean-to, and there was this stable in there, and the nice little animals. But re- really, historically, we believe it was a carved-out place in the side of a hill, back on the back part of a piece of property that nobody wanted to be at because mostly it was inhabited by angel, you know, shepherds when they came through to get some rest and to bring their, their sheep in. And there just happened to be in this little craggy rock an old feeding trough. I put a little star by this point because this is a big point because I want us to all to understand something tonight because this is big for everybody in this place, including me. There are so many things in this life that we do not understand. But can I tell you something? It doesn't mean that God's not at work. The devil is not under every rock coming after you. There are times and places when God uses difficult circumstances and situations for the betterment of our life because he knows us better than what we know ourselves. And he's working out and he's working in. And, and his goal for us is for us to live with him forever. Now, I'm, I'm going I'm to come back to a place so we all can understand this. The Apostle Paul. Other than Jesus, maybe the greatest man of God who ever walked on planet earth. He comes to 2 Corinthians, the latter part of 2 Corinthians. And he has this ongoing conversation that he's talking to the people about. He's gone to this place where he's talking about what a great apostle he is. And he's really being facetious in his writing. He's teaching them something through sarcasm, which I really like. But he gets real serious. And he says, you know, there is this thorn in the flesh. I really don't believe it, was some, it wasn't something that was mysterious to everyone. I, I mean, we understand the Apostle Paul that when he was on the road to Damascus that, that he was blinded. And we, we know historically that he dealt with problems with his eyesight from there on out. In fact, if you read in the book of Galatians, he writes to them, and he says, the problems that I have, and he says, look with what large letters I'm writing to you now. Now, can I ask you a question? What could be more humbling than have cloths taking off of your body that is literally making people well and whole, and people are being raised from the dead, and you're having problems with your own eyesight? Listen to me. What could be more humbling than that? And this is what he says. But God knows this. He knows that, and I'm going to use some Texanese and we're going to paraphrase here. He says, God knows I can't get above my raisin. Everybody know, knows what that means? That means you can't get too big for your britches. God knows that. God, God knows that if, if I didn't have this, my pride and my head and my ego would be like this. And I would really think that I'm somebody and I couldn't even be cont- control myself. This is the Apostle Paul talking about himself. So God tells me, this is what he says, in that weakness you have, there's great strength. My grace is sufficient for you. And the Apostle Paul takes one of the most not understandable moments in life. (coughs) That cloths are taking off his body and people are receiving their sight. Come on now. And he's still struggling. And this is what we all say. You ready for this? That's not fair. And can I tell you something? The moment that we allow that to be entertained in our heart and mind, we begin to operate in doubt of who and what God is. Right. 
Because what you're saying is that God in all of his providence and understanding is not big enough to see the bigger picture that you're not able to see. He has limited vision. And he just cares about this temporary thing that's going on with you. And when we look at this story, that the Son of God, of all the things he could have come, you know, we are infatuated with Star Wars and superheroes. Come on now. Somebody asked me, I'm not either. Somebody asked me today, Jonathan loved Star Wars, by the way. And somebody asked me today, one of the guys on the staff said, Pastor, aren't you going to go see the movie? I said, I saw the first one in 1978 and didn't like it. Why would I go back now? <laughs> I haven't changed my mind about that. And so they said, yeah, it's just like you in Planet of the Apes. I said, yeah, it's stupid. <laughs> Apes riding horses. I said, why don't the horses talk? So they said, oh, and the new one, it's because they got this vaccine or something. I said, that wasn't the first one. <laughs> Charlton Heston was there. Oh, y'all don't know. Moses was there in the Planet of the Apes. <laughs> Listen to me, folks, because this, this is so big for our body. This is so big for everyone here in this Christmas season to gather and understand. Because I want you to understand something. There comes a time and a place often in our lives where we encounter things that are not understandable to us. And the first thing in our flesh begins to say is, why me? And you can take it from anger to bitterness to resentment to pity party to depression. All typifies a lack of understanding and more importantly, a lack of our faith in God who is really in control. The Son of God is born in a cave. Why did it You know, I read this story. I'm telling you, every year I read this story and I'm amazed. I, I mean, I, why, why not come as Superman? You know, it wasn't an original story, Superman wasn't. That the Son of God could have come down and called down angels from heaven and made a magnificent appearance and made everybody bow down to him and say, I'm the Messiah and here we go. But we look at this story and we say, are we sure? God, why, why would he come and do that? Why didn't he do something so fantastic and, you know, light up the sky around Bethlehem and everybody comes and bows down and says, ooh. But God's selective about even with the baby who sees the baby. And there's something important in that. And that comes to our fourth point. Why appear to shepherds? Now, I've asked this question and asked this question and asked this question. And I've come to my own private understanding. And I want to share that with you tonight. Why the shepherds? Because possibly they might have been the only people in the world that could believe the Messiah could be laying in a feeding trough. Imagine how that would sound to you. The angel coming on the street, the Messiah is born, and he's down the street, way past the barn, out back. Take a left, it, it, don't step in that stuff, right out there. And he's in a feeding trough where the angels, where, where the donkeys and sheep eat every day. That's where he's lying. And, and I'm going to tell you something most people would miss Jesus. Because we would say, oh, that's not how God works. Whew. My God, he's a prosper given God. He would never have his son born in a feeding trough. And we would let our American idealism, and we would miss Jesus. And he appears to shepherds. 
tending their fields at night. He says, something great's happening tonight. It's joyful to the whole world. And you're going to find him down here in that cave in a feeding trough. And they don't even blink. They say, let's go see this thing they've said. It's not like, why would God do that? I, I don't get it. That doesn't make any sense to us. It says that they went. And can I tell you something? And I'm as guilty as anybody in this place tonight. You ready for this? I'm as guilty as when I don't understand, I don't move. How many know what I'm talking about? Doesn't make any sense to me. And because it doesn't make any sense to me, I just stay pat. I'm just going to stay here because that doesn't make any sense to me. And how many times do we miss God because it doesn't make any sense to us? No, it can't be God. This, God, wouldn't, God wouldn't operate like that. God wouldn't allow this to come in my life. This, this is just too overwhelming and too hard. Uh, and I always said, God, it couldn't get any harder, and it just gets harder. That, that couldn't be God. I mean, people say that we're supposed to be blessed, and I feel more cursed than blessed. Come on now. And we come to church. And we lift our hands, and we want to believe, and we definitely want to go to heaven. But our lack of understanding has inhibited our faith. And, and what I'm trying to convey to you tonight from this story is no matter what you can think or see, God is still in control. And the word tells us as his church. Now, this, this is interesting. And I've got a whole different thought and opinion, idea, theology about how we differ from the New Testament church. And I'm not going to get into all that tonight. New Testament church many times is referred to, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 2. He refers to the church as being sanctified and holy. And it was a given understanding that while the church was not, quote-unquote, the Hebrews or the nation of Israel, they were the new Israel. Did everybody understand what I'm saying? It's not that God negated his promises with Israel, but we, we, the church now became God's chosen people. And being God's chosen people, what that meant is that we are distinctly different than everyone else. And the church is to be a place that is distinctly different than every other place. It's not given to a place where we just say, anybody and everybody come in and do what you want to in here. Can I tell you something? That's not the church. Now, that's the American church because we want money to fuel our programs. But that's not the church. Because the church is very relational, so much so that there's checks and balances in all of our lives, not just the preacher's life. That people, and you know the Word of God says, you heard Pastor, Pastor Jim say this a couple of weeks ago, I believe it was him that said this. Maybe, maybe it was somebody else I heard preaching, maybe it was Pastor Glenn or maybe even Pastor Brian that said they, that they sent out... Paul and Silas. It says the elder sent, it says the Holy Spirit sent them out. You say, well, those are men. It says, no, the Holy Spirit used those men and sent them out. And that's what the local church is. It's a direct agent of God. And it's not left up to our opinion about what we like or what we don't like. I'm not here to be a dictator tonight, and that's not my intention at all. But I'm telling you something. We've negated God working in faith in our life because this is what happens. Uh, if something is contrary to what we believe, we go down the road. 
And, and what I'm trying to tell you is this. God works through our fence. Uh, that w- there wasn't a big amen there. God works through our fence. It was Jesus himself said that, listen, I've come, and most everybody I come to is going to be offended, and they're going to stumble. And he says, you probably will too. And later on, listen to this, John the Baptist is sitting in prison. He's had a magnificent ministry. He is Jesus' cousin. He has watched his ministry. He knows Jesus. He knows the whole story of the birth. He knows all the supernatural. He knows everything. about. But he is sitting in prison, and he doesn't understand. So he says this, are you really the Messiah? And Jesus simply says this, you go back and tell John, deaf ears hear, blind eyes see, the dead are being raised. Blessed is him who doesn't fall away on account of me. In other words, I am who I say I am, but your situation may not go the way that you think it's going to go. Oh, that, that's tough sledding right there. Just like with the Apostle Paul. Paul, you prayed and prayed, and my grace is sufficient for you. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, God, why everybody else and not me? Uh, why, why do people secretly get money wired to their account and not me? Why do people get cars given to them and not me? I don't understand. It's not fair. And somewhere in our mind, we have fooled ourselves. We fooled ourselves because we, we forget about the millions imprisoned in the Middle East and China for their faith that are tortured and dying every day. And we want to talk about what's not fair to us because we don't have the newest model car like everybody else. Can I, everybody get in this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Because I want us to understand something. This is the great maturing factor for all of us. Oftentimes in our life, faith operates through things that are, aren't understandable. Somebody say amen. amen. If you know what I'm talking about, say amen. amen. They're not understandable. Doesn't make any sense. And yet this story, if you read this story really and you look at it logically, you say, that story doesn't make any sense. (laughs) The Son of God, born of a virgin, no room in the inn, old stable trough, shepherds. (laughs) (laughs) If it weren't in the Bible, I wouldn't believe it. Because God doesn't work like that. And can I tell you something? God does work like that. Because he's a great big picture God. And me, I can't see beyond the end of my nose. Honestly. Lord, just get me out. This is the toughest thing I've ever been in. Well, you hadn't seen tomorrow yet. And I, I've learned how to change how I pray. I no longer pray for relief. I pray for resolution. Either there's got to be a resolution in me or there's got to be a resolution in something else, but there has to be a resolution because it's not about relief. Because relief is temporary. And you come back after the relief, and listen to this. Nothing's changed. 
like I said a few, a few days ago, you can, you can go to Disney World and escape and come back home to your mortgage just not paid. And the cleaning fairy, like Shelly says, didn't come to your house and clean everything out, out and wash the dishes and clean the clothes. Nothing happened. And you say, I want to go back to Disney World. And so when I pray, this is how I pray. I no longer pray for relief. I say, God, there's got to be a resolution. And either there's going to have to be a change in me or there's going to be a change in the circumstance. And oftentimes, I'm going to tell you, it's the first. (laughs) More than 90% of the time, it's in the first. My grace is sufficient for you. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. You can do it. You can make it. I don't want to do it. I, I don't want to do it. I thought you were a better daddy than this. You'd take care of me, but you're not. And we have this big issue with him. And you know what? He confronted me on a couple of weeks ago sitting right there. I mean, I was sitting on the front row. Some stuff has been going on in our lives. And God says, you're mad at me. And I said, oh, no, I'm not. He said, yeah, you are. This is what you said. And he told me what I said. And I, I began bawling because I said, you're right, I am. I'm mad at you. I am. Because it's not always understandable. But faith goes back to that old song we used to sing in church. Remember that one? I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. You know, we, we, we need to sing that. We, I shall not be moved. Because you know why? It comes a time and a place where you understand there are a lot of people that don't come to church anymore because they don't understand God. And, and can I tell you the honest truth of what's happening? And I'm not going to I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. There are a lot of people that are going to spend eternity in hell because they don't want to understand God. Either he's good all the time or he's not. And even when it's in a stable and a pregnant lady has to travel miles on a donkey in the last trimester, forced by the government to do it, with a man she hardly knows, And they're walking this path, and it gets to the end, and it says, And Mary pondered all these things in her heart. What does that mean? You know, it's it's easy to have faith when the angel of the Lord is peering to you and saying, Favored among women. It's a lot tougher when, when, when you've just had a baby in a stable, and a bunch of shepherds have showed up to call him the Messiah. And you're thinking, wow, I thought this was going to be a lot different than this. <laughs> Crowns and coronation and, whoa, you know, this, was gonna, this doesn't look anything like the way I thought it was going to look. Anybody ever pondered things in your heart? <laughs> this didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to turn out. But you know what? God's still in control. I want to pray for some folks tonight. Will you bow your heads with me? I want to pray for those struggling with the faith struggle tonight. Say, Pastor, I'm in a place where it doesn't make sense to me. But I'm willing to surrender. And that's going to be the key tonight. I'm willing to surrender my will. Even when I don't understand. I'm willing to surrender my will even though I don't understand. 
If that's you tonight, will you raise your hand and say, that pastor, that's me. I, I'm willing to surrender my will even though I don't understand. Lord, these are my friends and my family that are raising their hands. And I'm not talking to them. I'm not talking to the air. I'm talking to you, a real and living God. That it says of your son that he was, he is, not he was, he is moved by our infirmities. That you were bruised for our transgressions. You were chastised and chastened. For us. And tonight, Lord, we're not praying for relief. We're praying for resolution through our surrender. And our declaration is that you are the God who is in control without doubt. We are your children. We are called, sanctified, set apart, marked by you. And our, our, our desire tonight is this. Whatever you desire, whatever you want, we will do. For some, that's a huge risk. Because they're thinking, what if I have to stay in the situation that I'm in right now? The Lord, I know that you're big enough to provide peace, love, and joy where I don't have. You're big enough to do that. You're able to take, even in the midst of the direst, most hardest circumstances in life, and prove that you're God. So God, I pray tonight that you begin to bring resolution. Bring resolution that our faith, Lord, that our faith can grow stronger, that we can pray for the sick and they will recover. We can raise the dead and we can give you all the glory and honor. In spite of the fact that there are times and places in our life where things aren't perfect, but you are. So God, our faith is in you, not in ourselves, not in our ability, not in our ability to even understand tonight. Our faith is in you. So, Lord, we surrender. We surrender. We surrender tonight. And, Lord, I seal believing all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Stand with me tonight. It has been good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. No place I would rather be than here tonight. It's so good to be here with you guys tonight. Let, let's take the opportunity before we leave tonight because there may be people that you're supposed to minister to tonight. That's not always the preacher that has to do the, the ministering, that you're a minister, amen? So love somebody as you're leaving tonight. We love you. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Lord bless you.